It's amazing that explaining life's immense diversity All comes down to some genetics and some biochemistry And life on earth is just one family And what's true for you is true for all biology Hello, welcome to Genetic Shambles Live. We're here again as we are uh, on many, many Wednesdays over the last, I think, uh, probably done eight or nine of these shows now. It's always an interesting thing to do, this live show, because uh, unlike in real life when I used to do gigs or kind of host panels, you always go somewhere and you haven't just eaten your tea, whereas I've just eaten my tea. So uh, I really haven't got enough blood in my brain to necessarily get through the next 50 minutes, but we're going to do it anyway because we have two experts uh, who are going to be enlightening us about many different ideas. Uh, within genetics but in particular today we're going to be looking at uh different uh problems ideas and philosophies within the ethics of genetics and i'll just quickly mention by the way that say uh, thank you to the people who make this possible which is the genetic society and the milner center for evolution at the university of bath as well and uh, all the previous episodes as well they're still available you can either see the video version like this or there's also audio versions and they're at cosmic shambles.com slash cosmic shambles uh or you can also find them at uh, genetics unzipped and uh, uh, then uh, oh, I was going to mention, by the way, we've also just put up online. Uh, we're going to do a great big 24 hour show uh, replacing all the live shows that I normally do with Brian Cox and various other scientists, musicians and uh, and comedians. We're going to be doing that on the 12th of December, a live 24 hour show from midday uh, to midday on the 13th of December with uh, Chris Hadfield and Sophie Ellis Baxter and uh, um, Jocelyn Belbonnell and many other people. So you can also find out about that at Cosmic Shambles. And I also mentioned that the next episode of Genetic Shambles is going to be uh, Ethan McLeiser, uh, who is absolutely fantastic, uh, based at uh, Trinity. As I'm sure many of you will have seen her lecture before and may will have seen the uh, Christmas lectures that she did uh, with Alice Roberts as well. And so if you have any specific questions for Aoife, because we're going to do just a, a one-to-one conversation uh, about her work and about genetics generally, if you've got any questions about that, send those as well. And also, if you've got questions tonight, as this is live, then you can just pop them at the live chat and uh, Trent, our producer, will send them to me. And uh, you can also just tweet them at Cosmic Shambles as well. Now, let me introduce our guest. Our guest today are Dr. Sarah Chan, Sarah uh, Chan, who is Royal Society Fellow and Chancellor's Fellow in Ethics at the Usher Institute within the Medical School at the University of Edinburgh, and Professor Anna Middleton, Middleton who's, who's Head of Society and Ethics Research Group at the Wellcome Genome Campus, and a Professor and Lecturer in the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. Hello to both of you. Hi. Um, I'm going to start with a question which is not on the subject at all because it was just something that fascinated me when I was reading the stuff uh, about your work, Sarah, and your areas of interest, something which I have no real idea of what the implications are. You said that one of the things particularly interested you was constructing the value of species in conservation ecology. Can you explain to me what that is about? What that is about? Okay, so ever since I was young, I've been interested in biology, passionate about conservation. I think when you ask the question, should we save this endangered species? Uh, You know, the answer is always, yes, saving species is important, conservation is important. But the question is, why? What is it that we're trying to preserve? In in other words, what is it that is of value? What is it we're trying to save here? Um, And I'll give you a couple of examples that kind of throw this this question into a new light. We generally think that we should try to preserve species and that species extinction is a bad thing. But there is at least one species that we've made successfully extinct in the wild that we think it's a good thing that we've done that, and that's the smallpox virus. Another example, um, quite recently, so giraffes are giraffes, yeah? But quite recently, so within the last few years, they've decided that giraffes aren't just giraffes. There are now four different species of giraffe. Is there now four times as much value in the world with these four different species of giraffe as there was when they were all one big happy giraffe species. So how that's it's an interesting question, but it's also I think important because it helps us identify what we're trying to do. 
when we look at conservation, are we trying to save the most unique species? Are we trying to save the species that's the um, that's keystone within the ecology? Are we saving the species that we like? It's no coincidence, I think, that pandas became the emblem of the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Um, do we preserve the more useful species, the ones that could benefit humans? So I think there are really important questions here that get to the heart of, well, why is it we do what we do? Why is it we should do what we think we should do? And that's actually in many ways, the question that lies behind bioethics, why should we do what we think we should do? Thanks. It is also, in a way, um, I, I think there is a connection here, you know, uh, Robin, to tonight's topic of genetics, because one of the ways in which we could understand value in species is through genetic diversity. So perhaps in some ways, you know, the more unique a species is, uh, the more we want to preserve it. If you have two species that are virtually identical, save for a few genes, maybe preserving one or the other of them is is just fine. Uh, so maybe there is something in there to explore for how we understand genetics. And how much? I mean, what once that we the 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 kind of the the, the revolutionary in gene, in genetics, how much has that changed? That the, basically the the number of species. You know, I was reading a book about flies today, and it's kind of like we just thought there was this one fly, but it turns out this one fly that looks as, as you were saying that looks pretty much the same is actually twenty five different species of fly, and we realize yeah, all of those things. It's a it's a fascinating change in in our understanding. Yes, and actually that reads across interestingly from ways in which we understand animals to ways in which we understand humans. You know, how much are we now understanding different species through a genetic lens? How much are we understanding ourselves as humans through the lens of our genetics and our relationships to others? So if you think of, for example, the genetic analyses of how closely or how intermingled um, humans were with Neanderthals, if you think of discovering our, our sort of hominid family tree through evolutionary ge genetics, we are starting to understand ourselves as genetic creatures. Um, and so that same idea of, well, when you look at the genetics, this looks like one species is but is two, or looks like two species but is one. We're also applying that same sort of, let's think, let's think ourselves through our genes. We apply that to humans as well. Yeah, I, I love that. That kind of moment where we're going to need a bigger tree actually we're not going to need a tree at all it turns out we're going to need a new metaphorical map to connect these things and i think that's that's fascinating and i think all these changes anna if i can bring you in as well i i, I know that one of the things that uh you're particularly interested in is uh trying to find uh new ways of engaging with the public about ideas of genetics and i, I wonder what you feel are the the problems at the moment in terms of public understanding of genetics and what you've also found to be the most useful ways of getting information across and getting understanding across. Well, we know that genetics has moved out of the clinic and into direct consumer testing and, and beyond the individual into the family and now into, into society. So even if you personally have never had any level of genetic testing before, you're going to be related to somebody who has, and whether that's through ancestry testing or medical testing or research or even just being a blood donor, um, your data may be used in genetic research. And so there's this urgent need now really to have a societal engagement about what genetics means for you and what are some of the ethical issues raised around um, security and data sharing and confidentiality. Um, and so it's sort of shifted in terms of, well, why do I need to know about this now because I'm having a specific test to, well, what does this mean for my relatives? and the sort of conversation has gone broader and, and people don't need a degree in genetics there's a lot of you know talk about increasing literacy and health literacy and education and things but my position is that we really just need to increase awareness and familiarity because we know that that is very very low um, and the way that people get their awareness about genetics at the moment is really through popular culture because after leaving school, um, it's not really something that you tend to engage with it with unless it's through media or pop popular culture. And I would say, great to use that as a springboard for conversations. Um, so some of the research that we've been doing is uh, looking at um, some of the metaphors that are quite useful for translating some of the science. So instead of talking about a pathogenic variant, which you might hear in a, in a clinical setting, let's talk about a glitch in DNA or something, you know, something that's just much more colloquial, that's easily understandable. So um, some of the work we've been doing is looking at what does that translation look like for everyday people? Because I think that is, people do, as you said, you said, people do get very worried when they hear words like heritability. 
mm. uh, and and getting that getting a greater fact that because I think very in 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 the early days in, in, of, of this century there was a sense in some of the pieces that were written in the popular press uh, where your genetics could well your, your genes could be your doom instead you know the, the nature nurture element and all of that blurred central ground didn't seem to get very well covered mm. yeah exactly, exactly. and, and, and the, the way that the framing around it often has a certain tone it could be quite alarmist it could be quite scary it could be quite kind of sci-fi where are we going this is something to be kind of worried about um, and you know that the, the science kind of literacy doesn't really help with that I mean when we uh, there's often sort of real push to try and explain what genomic sequencing is and talking about you know base pairs and things and you know and I would say well sequencing is a bit like doing a google of yourself you know if you do a google search you might find stuff that's accurate about yourself you might find a load of rubbish that means absolutely nothing you might find misleading stuff you might find new stuff you might find stuff that you didn't know about before so that's sort of what genome sequencing is so you know, one of the things that we've been doing is trying to look at neutral ways of re reframing the conversation. So it isn't alarmist. It isn't, you know, genetically modified food and designer babies. Oh, my goodness, designer babies. Don't know if I use that. But, uh, oh, I wish that term would just go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the sort of term that we just we just get to hear so much in relation to what we do. And, um, you know, I, I'm often trying to sort of take the sting out of that and say, well, hang on, you know, genetics is about connection. It's about sharing. It's about similarities um, between us. Um, it's about family. It's about things in families, you know, and, and making it sort of relevant to, to the everyday kind of life, really. Is that so? Is, is that the... Which be, with something like genetics, because uh, a news media generally wants a shortcut and alarmist also is, is, is useful clickbait, that that kind of Aldous Huxleyan vision of the designer baby's world, the the, the world of, of of how you will be able to you know be be manipulated, manipulate your children, etc. Is is that do you feel that's been very very detrimental? Yeah, I think we're moving I think we're moving more towards responsible science communication, not just from scientists, but through the media. We need to recognise, of course, that these genetic technologies have a long history and that the sorts of discussions we're having now about uh, genetic testing or about human genome editing have resonances with decades past when uh, when the debate of genetically modified food came up uh, and then even further back, obviously, the spectre of eugenics. So I think we need to be really aware that all of these terms carry not just scientific meaning but even more uh, social, historical, emotional resonances. And as Anna says, really to think about how we can communicate what's going on and engage with publics about what their what their thoughts, what their concerns, what their hopes are for genetic technologies without resorting to invoking those sort of sensationalist headline headline tropes. Well, can I just sort of get, because we're, we're really? with, with a couple of, of definitions, I suppose, if that's okay. And, um, and one of them is when people see the term gene therapy, what should they know about what is intended by that term? Do you want to go, Sarah? Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, Sarah. I, I, you <laughs> sorry, is that directly? There as it's because I always forget that I'm looking directly at you on my screen, but that's <laughs> not how the communication works. We've well. only been in a pandemic for six months, and still <laughs> both Zoom and Skype, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, okay. I'm I'm very new to this. No, sorry. So if that was directed at if me, that was directed at me. Um, so I suppose gene gene therapy, I would say, can refer to a broad range of, of treatments. Um, there's everything from things like um, therapies that are designed using genetics. There's things like um, things like um, RNA therapies and and the like. But I think the one that so the one that gets people really really taxed, I suppose. The one that pe most people find ethically challenging isn't just a treatment that includes DNA. I mean, my face moisturiser apparently contains DNA. Um, but what they're worried about is therapy that makes changes to human DNA. So whether that's making changes to just one type of cell or tissue, or whether it's making the kind of genetic changes that could then be passed on to children's children, etc. I think when, when we talk about the ethics of gene therapy, we're really talking about the ethics of changing human genes for therapeutic purposes. 
brilliant thank you that uh, we know uh firstly Anna, if i can start with with you on this which is uh a lot of people would like to know about the new genome uk strategy oh. what it is and what does it mean okay so this Okay, so this came out on the 26th of September, and actually it's been a long time in the making, very, very exciting. It's to build on the launch of the new genomic medicine service that came into the NHS in 2018. So this is looking at the future of um, healthcare and genomic medicine being part of that. Um, so it's looking at predicting disease, preventing disease, um, and treating disease, and also personalizing treatments um, depending on the person's genetic profile. So that could be um, a cancer tumour um, and looking at the genetics of the tumour and then personalising the chemotherapies to that specific tumour. Um, or it could be um, predicting whether a couple are likely to have um, a child with a, a developmental disorder. Or it could be about predicting in a pregnancy, very early on in the pregnancy, whether the um, future baby is likely to have an increased risk of a, of a genetic condition. It's also about testing newborn babies um, to see if they have um, an increased risk of certain genetic conditions. Uh, so it's a whole sort of broad range of testing within the NHS. Um, and it's also about partnering with research as well and innovation. So that's what the strategy is about, is, is how the government's going to deliver a commitment to funding that and supporting that. And um, my goodness, it's quite an ambitious thing. It really is very ambitious. But the government strategy is interesting. If I was going to critique it, um, I would say there's a lot of focus on the science and the bioinformatics and the technology and the industry and the innovation, and not an awful lot of focus on how to communicate this. What does this mean for people? Who is going to deliver this information? How is this going to impact families long term? Um, not much talk about that. So there's a recognition that um, keeping trust and having public engagement is very, very important. And of course, that's absolutely great. But on the ground, in the clinic, when you're communicating with families, that's tricky stuff. And I know because I was a genetic counsellor for 15 years in the NHS, um, had that experience of being in a clinic room with families who are making sense of something that, you know, is just unfathomable to them. And it's causing, um, you know, real extreme emotions, guilt, fear, blame, stigma, um, long term uh, impacts of inherited information. Um, so that was what was slightly missing for me in the strategy. But um, I know certainly from working within this field, it's not missing. But it would be great if the government had really picked up on that as a as a as a real need to to focus on you know and invest in. Actually, I want to counsellor because I think that again, that's that's fascinating, and I, I would imagine also you know you're saying that for 15 years that. The, the the changes and the way that you are required to adapt to, to new information, how much is, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm interested philosophically about how you were able to prepare yourself with the combination, not merely of, of the scientific information, but also the, the nature of the, the, the emotive nature of what you were dealing with. Yeah, so the, the science and the clinical genetics, yes, I'm way out of touch with that because that, that changes really every that year. changes really every year and the clinical protocols and the patient pathways are updated all the time and the technology changes. But the, the pure kind of relationship that you have with another person where you're helping them to, you know, grapple with difficult stuff and you're, work, you're walking with them for a moment. You know, you're, you're with them in their shoes, helping them to make sense of it. That really hasn't changed. You know, that's that's basic counselling skills, and um, you know, that that kind of thing is is really it, you know very much celebrated <laughs> for quite a few years ago. And it's something that with um, cuts to the NHS and um, you know the, the sort of luxury of having a forty-five minute consultation is really under under pressure, really. So. Um, you know, I hope that the discipline of genetic counselling doesn't change too much because it really does add value in terms of of that emotional journey. Um, but, you know, who knows where it's actually going to go in the next sort of 10, 20 years time. Because, you know, discussions already at the moment about what's the use of chatbots, particularly in clinic. You know, can some of the consultation be done with a chatbot? You know, if you're taking consent, for example, um, can some of it be cut out and, and turned into, you know, a a digital kind of consultation 
Um, but that, of course, loses that human connection and that interaction. So it's all up for grabs at the moment. This is really evolving. It's a very exciting time to be a genetic counsellor, and particularly for me as an academic genetic counsellor, you know, looking at the evidence base behind the communication and where's that going. That's a very, the, the, the chatbot element, we were doing a panel the other day working out where that line is, where human presence is utterly necessary, is, is again, slightly blurrier than, than than people might imagine. And it's one of those things that sometimes when you have a bunch of people sitting on a panel, they can go and we can place the dot there. And that doesn't, you know, the, the, the humanity can get sometimes, I think, lost. Sarah, I wanted to ask you as well about your reaction to the new Genome UK strategy as well. So as Anna says, this, as Anna says, this is something that's been evolving for some time. So we've had genetic medicine for quite a long time, uh, back since the days of uh, sort of single gene testing. And I think what's really been evolving over the last, uh, well, about about a decade or so, has been the upscaling of that. So now it's not just single gene testing; uh, it's genome screening or even whole genome sequencing. So with this capacity for you know high throughput sequencing, rapid and low cost sequencing. Um, we now can, we have the capacity to generate these huge amounts of genomic data and clearly that information can be useful for health, uh, diagnostic or predictive, it can be useful for research, but we also need to understand how we're going to interpret that and what we're going to do with all that information. So some of the concerns around that uh, include uh, genetic or genomic privacy, who's going to have access to that information, what might your genes tell other people about you, what might your genes tell you about yourself that you might or might not want to find out, um, who's going to be able to use that, what are we going to do with that? So if we do genomic research and we generate new therapies, who's going to be in control of those, who's going to have access? If we can use a uh, genomic or genetic stratification to divide populations into different risk groups, so say cardiovascular risk, cancer risk, what does that stratification of health and healthcare within the populations do to the way that we understand health and disease and the way that we choose to fund and resource our healthcare systems? So I think there are lots of questions there about what a genomic medicine service uh, really is going to look like, what the wider implications will be for, for society uh, and how we're going to prepare to deal with those Mm. Is, I mean, in, in terms of the, the ethical concerns, again, this is something that a lot of people are, are wondering, uh, and we've had a lot of questions about this, which is that divide between what they might see uh, as non-scientists as the key uh, ethical concerns and what within genetics are the key ethical concerns. I wonder if you, f f from your experience, what you would say with, within science, what are, have been the key ones, and then perhaps the ones that you've heard most often from people who voice concern who are not uh um in research hmm. so i i would say that these concerns about who owns your genome or who can access your genome have quite a lot of resonance with, with publics um but that it's not always about what can people tell about me from my genome. So I think when often when I speak to scientists, uh, they try to address these concerns over who has access, who owns it, who has control by talking about things like data protection and the information security, the data security measures. Um, and what I've noticed from talking to publics is that, yes, there is concern about who has access to your DNA, but there's also this other level of concern about what's being done with the information and who does it benefit. And in particular, there's some concern around, so genomic data that comes through the NHS, that's a publicly funded healthcare service, who's going to use that? And it's going to be used for public benefit, that's one thing. But there is quite quite a strong feeling actually that you know the NHS, it's our NHS, it's our health data, it's our genomic data. There are some quite serious concerns about say, um, private companies or individuals having access to that and that then being used perhaps to generate for-profit research that um, that UK publics might not have access to. Now, of course, we know that the public-private divide is not nearly so simple as that and that industry partnerships are a very important part of research and innovation. But nevertheless, that sort of, is it for the public good or is it lining someone's pocket um, is actually something that comes up quite a lot. I, I would fully support that. Yeah, we've just done some really big empirical um, research on public attitudes. So we did a, a, a global survey in 22 countries in 
15 different languages with 37,000 representative public audiences across those countries. And that was the, the key issue for them. You know, what does trustworthiness look like for you? And they're saying things like, I want to know what, what are you going to do with my data? How are you personally going to benefit if I give you my data? Um, so just saying, oh, well, my data will be great for humankind and it will cure cancer. And it'll, it, you know, it contributes to this sort of global understanding about genetics and health and disease. People were saying, yeah, that's fine. But I want to know, um, is money going to be made from this and who's making money? Um, is this going to advance your career? Is this going to increase your funding opportunities? Is this going to increase your publications? Is this going to help you get more diagnoses for your patients, i.e. this is going to be better for your career? Um, and people understand that th there are benefits to others and they want to know what that is. They really want transparency and they also want the opportunity to, to withdraw as well if they're not happy. Um, and those are the fundamental sort of principles of good research ethics anyway. So that, that should be on the table. But we were asking also what, what you know, does a, a nice looking website with the profiles of all the researchers on there, does that, does that help you trust the people asking for your data? And then people were saying, no, not really. Just want to know how you will benefit. And there was, they were also saying things like, um, I trust my own personal doctor with my data, but I'm really less trusting of the for-profit industry. I'm not necessarily fully aware that there is a partnership. It's happening now. It's, it's there between non-profit, clinical and for-profit. The, the, the three are intertwined because that's how we're going to develop medicines and cures and treatments is, is by that partnership. And genomic data is bouncing around the internet, being accessed every second of the day at the moment. I mean, it's it's out there, it's being traded, it's being sold, it's being exchanged, it's being accessed for good things, mostly, of course. Um, and of course, people are, are protected and, you know, they're de-identified. But, you know, a key ethical issue here is that, you know, even if you take someone's name and address and date of birth from their genomic sequence, um, particularly if they have something rare or unusual in there, and particularly if they've got other information about themselves online, it's not too difficult to actually identify them. And so we were asking in our research, well, what, what you know, if you were identified, what would that mean for you? Um, is the benefit from that data being out there worth it for you, or are you worried about that? And people were saying, well, actually, what could you do with it? You know, could I be discriminated against in, in, in terms of insurance? You know, what if, if the police got hold of this? What about, would I be targeted for inappropriate marketing? Um, would this reveal stuff about me that I haven't chosen to tell my relatives or my family or my government or my employer? So there was all these sort of issues about, well, what could somebody do with this? Um, and also people were saying things like, well, could I be copied, my DNA be copied and planted at the scene of a crime? Is that technically possible? Well, actually, technically, it is technically possible, not easy to do, you know, not reproduce all those sorts of things. But, that, you know, in a sci fi way, you could actually do the science of that. Um, so there's quite a lot that needs to be tightened up and there's no consistent global governance on this. Um, and so that's really what we're kind of working towards We're in this kind of sort of slight and certain, well, very uncertain situation because, um, yeah, there isn't this global kind of network that that keeps us all consistently safe and this is the thing about research is it doesn't really pay too much attention to geographical boundaries because it's all accessed by the internet crossing legal jurisdictions crossing crossing ethical boundaries you know it's just all kind of out there because it's online um, so there's lots that needs to be tightened up and certainly from the research that we've done public are curious about that you know, wanting answers and wanting to feel, are we actually in partnership with scientists about this? Because they're really not up to speed at all. What a terrifying answer. Um, <laughs> because it is, it's, uh, I mean, one of the, the interesting ones, of course, which has has a positive outcome, but then there are, um, was it was it the Golden Gate murderer? I'm trying to remember. There was a, you know, where because someone else in his family had wanted to find out whether they have Neanderthal DNA or whatever it was. Yeah. is actually the way that this person had but but that's an interesting thing isn't it which is how when you talk about the idea of some form of global governance what is the nearest that we have at the moment in terms of international countries in terms of how this information can travel and where it can travel to and from but do, do, what protocols exist at the moment so there is the global so there is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which um, uses a human rights framework to underpin um, 
structure but it's not you know it's a voluntary thing that you sign up to and the global alliance for genomics and health does consist of 500 um smaller organizations including you know yeah, the Broad and Harvard and Sanger Institute and all the big sort of genomic medicine services. Um, but, you know, that, that because of the league, that there is no sort of, you know, law that covers all of us, um, you have to kind of voluntarily sign up to it. But the principle that, that the Global Alliance uses is that we all have the benefit to, we have, all have the right to benefit from science um, and that we all should sign up to uh, responsible models of data sharing. And then there's a st sort of structure falling out from that about what does responsible data sharing actually look like. So there's a sort of skeleton structure there, but it's not legally binding. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's up for... Sarah, do you think, I mean, there is that, that, that one of the great, I suppose, paranoid uh, positions is that sense of monetization is that sense you know we've seen that certainly with genetically modified crops such which is the moment that you have a large company and they might turn out that they're not being unethical but the moment that money is being made and of course money is always going to be made from any any innovations that's going to be found then we have uh, it seems that certainly amongst quite a few people the knee jerk reaction is there must be something evil going on here there must be something duplicitous going on here how do we get that kind of balance of 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 understanding that position because i presume you know there will be occasions where you look and you go well do you know what that was extremely unscrupulous and that was duplicitous and there's other times where you go it's a big company and that's just what they work in well, I think that's where transparency and engagement is is really key. So actually, if something, if, if we have an, a genetic innovation that's really useful, going to have huge benefit to health, obviously a lot of people are going to want to have access to it. That's going to make it a successful innovation. And then if we can find ways to upscale it, to disseminate it, more people can benefit. And that's probably going to mean that whoever's making it is making more money out of it. But you're getting benefit at the same time. So I suppose the the idea is not that no profit should be made, but the idea is much more wanting to know where the interests lie, um, what's being done with it, who is benefiting, and in particular, are those benefits being fairly distributed? So there have been a few cases, for example, where patients have banded together and um, have mobilised research, have raised funds, um, have worked with scientists to develop a genetic test, and then the scientists have turned around and said, now we're going to pay for this test. And if you or any of your families want to take it, you're going to have to pay thousands of dollars. And I just think, you know, there's something that seems fundamentally unjust about that, that work that was done with the support of, with the money of, with genetic resources of a patient group should then be used to make something they can't afford. So I think there are all those mm. concerns about who who's benefiting, who's supporting the research, who's undertaking the burden of being a participant, and then are they getting anything out of that? Is, um, we've got our first kind of questions coming in online now. This is, uh, I'll start, start with you, Anna. This is picking up, up on something you said. Laura C. wanted to know, uh, do you feel that there is too much nothing in the communication of genetic modification more than in other scientific fields, regardless of where it is used? It often seems to be uh, the MSN only portrays something as organic or as Jurassic Park. <laughs> Yeah, th there is an awful lot of that. Um, and I, I don't think we can get away from it. And so my position would be to try and work with it and use it, as, as I said right at the beginning, as a springboard to start a conversation. Um, and, I, you know, th th there's so much power in terms of media and popular culture. If we think of CSI, you know, having, I think it's something like between 30 and 50 million viewers around the world per episode. You know, the, the reach of that is so enormous and genetics as, as a theme for identifying bodies and solving crime is, is just integral with that. Um, so instead of saying, well, you know, let's try and tone down the alarm, the alarmist kind of position. Let's just use that to start the conversation and, and, and look at, well, you know, what's real from that? How could it be used? How could that apply to me? Use that as a way in because we know at the moment. You know, 85% of the people in the UK, you ask them, what does the word genome mean? And they've never even heard of it. Um, and we did some, some qualitative work with members of the public, and they were breaking the word down phonetically, genomics. Is it to do with gnomes and economics? You know, really grasping at straws, because 
They've never heard of it. So if CSI can get something out there about DNA and genomics and sequencing, then great, you can then build on that. So um, yeah, th there is this extreme stuff and I just think there's not really too much we can do with it. But I mean, I'm also very interested in how we might capture that in some way. You know, the, the, the public organizations that fund research and support the scientists, can we buy a few lines in the Arches or Coronation Street to get some good information out there? You know, can we partner with Hollywood writers to get some really good stories out there? You know, can we just, you know, build on what's already out there and feed correct information and the, the correct situations in there? I'm very interested in that. Where when you think again of the mass media, the fact that, you know, um, broadly amongst all newspapers and uh, how few outlets, not just newspapers, but on television, etc., the, the lack of enough scientific journalists, because you so often science is reported by people who uh, will not be able to read the paper, will not understand what its connotation is they can only read the first page which is the press release and i think what you're saying there is one of those things which immediately it means if someone wants information they're going to have to go to specialist sources and will they know where that is yeah and that's really tricky and so you know what we need to do you know what we need to be doing is, is being able to signpost people to the the right correct scientifically accurate though still socially constructive information that's out there about genomics um, and so, you know, there is an awful lot of focus on the science. And we know that, uh, you know, the double helix, you know, brings certain sort of imagery to people. Often it's all oh, that sciencey. I didn't do science at school. I'm not going to understand. It can be a real barrier. And particularly in the clinical setting where you want to really try and convey, you know, meaning within an emotional context. You don't want to be alienating people and saying this is this is too sciencey for you to understand because actually this is about you and your family. So we have to be thinking very carefully about the words that we're using and the, and the feeling and the emotion that we're giving behind them. So avoid the double helix if that's not helpful. Um, avoid using the word genome. Use the word glitch. You know, make it relatable. Use the language that families themselves are using. Build on their science capital. That the 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 um, you know amazing ways that they're communicating about other things. Build on that. And that's what genetic counselling is about: is enabling that conversation to happen. And that that takes a bit of time, but it, it's a, it's about not not keeping this distance and this hierarchy and this sort of elitism, which is very much there with genomics. It's very complicated. It feels like astrophysics, doesn't it? It feels really difficult, and it shouldn't be any of that because it's about it's about family and connection. It is a problem, is it? Because people are so scared of looking stupid. I put in first yeah. comments around that, that they would rather not ask the question, and it's it's. I might want to say, have you watched Jurassic Park or Gattaca or, you know, have you seen the Simpsons episode on ancestry testing or ancestry testing or whatever? You know, I'd use that as a way in and um, and then build on that. You're right. Pop culture is, is uh, that that's a, a great Trojan horse. Uh, Sarah, for you, uh, this is uh, this is from Led Zepp 331. I think we know their favourite band. And this is uh, if someone is genetically tested and an issue is found out that would also affect sibling stroke offspring. Do you think there should be a legal requirement? requirement for disclosure or should medical confidentiality always take priority oh is sarah frozen sarah oh she it's it's I always an intro it's a, well you could uh, and please feel free to ask that as well and then when, when uh yeah so um so in terms of the le the legal issue there that was recently covered in a, a case that came to a conclusion in january of this year um, and this was centering on whether there was a legal duty to warn um, relatives of an inherited genetic condition. And the court concluded that um, there is a duty to relatives within you know, genetic consultations um, and that if the clinician or the genetic counsellor or the health professional um, weighs up the, the duty to the relative to know this information against the patient's wishes um, and if they deem that that duty is is um, very helpful for that relative i.e for predicting disease and preventing disease then the uh, clinician should follow that duty of care to relatives so legally they're protected if they want to well not want to this is all done very very sensitively um, if there are um, relatives that want to know information that the, the, the primary patient is not wanting to share um, then the clinician now has to weigh up whether um, they feel that the relatives have a right to know. And if they do feel that they do, then they have a legal duty to act on informing them. 
So that was uh, a piece of case law that came through at the beginning of this year, and it could have profound implications for practice. And actually, it it's, it turns into law something that was already there in clinical practice anyway, in the professional recommendations uh, for genetic cancers and clinical geneticists, but it just firms that up um, so that, you know, we, we've always known, you know, families uh, have lots of, you know, interesting relatives in there and some want to know, some don't want to know. Um, and this this um, piece of law that, that came through recently really has firmed up that, that relatives have duties of care to them as well as a primary patient. You just Thank you. Sorry, that was just about uh, medical confidentiality and and whether information should be shared uh, if there's kind of for siblings, uh, etc. I'm going to uh, ask we because we're almost running out of time. Actually, we've only got to question two, which is all my fault, not yours, because we I, I made you tangential. Uh, what is uh, the next frontier in genetics research and studies that will push up against our ethical boundaries? And I know that's always a tricky question, Sarah, because what what's going to happen next is uh, that, but but that, that's that's the question that we've just had in. Well I, think the, well, I think the big one that everybody is talking about at the moment is genome editing humans and whether we might start to do this in a way that uh, could be passed on. Uh, so at the moment, in many, you can undertake uh, genome editing or genetic modification in a way that won't be passed on to children, but it is prohibited by law in many countries to do it in a way that would be passed on, i.e. what we call heritable genome editing. Um, but, of course, as the technology becomes better, as it becomes safer and better understood, I think the questions come up as to why would you, why wouldn't you want a beneficial condition? Why wouldn't you want a genetic cure to be passed on? If we know it works and we know it's safe, why would you say we'll cure it for you but your children have to take their chances or um, have to have the cure every time. So I think uh, there's this is probably something that we're going to have to consider in the next few years. Under what conditions would we think it, it was appropriate to deploy this technology? What sorts of factors would we need to take into consideration? What sorts of dialogues do we need to have with publics, with different groups, in order to decide whether and when it would be appropriate to take this step? Mm. Uh, um it is it's such an interesting you know, this it, it seems that you know th this area of ethics and as you said before the 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 speed of change the speed of it that that sense of as you know this is always the moment where people will bandy around you know humans playing god and it does seem to have been one of the uh sometimes richest and sometimes you know one of the darkest areas of of, of trying to understand different motivations as well so i think the playing god really taps into an, a number of different concerns. I mean, one is we're meddling with things we don't understand. And certainly when it comes to genome editing, the genome is very complex. Uh, scientists are aware, though, that you can't just assume you'll make a change and then and then that's fixed it. So a lot of the work that's going on at the moment is really around trying to understand what the net effects might be of deploying this technology. And the consensus is very much until we understand it better until we understand it well enough to be worth the risks that we might be taking then let's wait let's research more let, let's find out um, but then i think that there's also the the idea that well we shouldn't seek to control everything uh, perhaps it's good to leave some things up to chance etc and actually you know you don't leave your children's health up to chance when it comes to when it comes well i hope you don't leave your children's health Lots of chance when it comes to things like vaccination or good diet or holding their hand when they cross the road so they don't get run over. So, you know, if we had genetic ways to try and ensure better health, why wouldn't we use them? Mm. This, this is, uh, um, and the, the, we've, we've nearly run out of time. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm just trying. We've had a load of questions in at the last minute, and it's always. Um, this is a, a, a very interesting one, actually. Anna, I'll start with you, which is uh, the idea of empirical data on ethics. And that's always a, an, an intriguing idea of, of, of how do we collate the data and, and create in some ways almost uh, because it seems, seems sometimes something like ethics and placing that in the scenario of the scientific method that can be problematic uh how do we do that yeah so uh, yeah so i mean i would say that some of what we do is empirical bioethics which which really means that um an ethical conundrum is at the heart of the questions that we ask 
Um, and because of all of our research is about genetics to some degree, um, I mean, ethics and genetics just go hand in hand. You know, it's 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 all about, um, you know, who, who owns data, what would you want to know, what would you not want to know, um, at what point would you want to know it, um, security, privacy, confidentiality, consent, um, autonomy, um, doing good, doing harm with data, I mean, all of those kinds of bioethical principles I mean we, we frame as questions and that's what we ask people so that's the empirical this is the asking for views about that but you can't ever really have empirical data without having the ethical philosophical theoretical you know debate and discussion as well the two have to go together I and mean, sometimes they exist on their own but to get a, a, a better kind of picture you want to come at this from lots of different angles and also using lots of different methods as well so qualitative quantitative ethnographic you know just bringing lots of different ways of asking questions and debating and thinking and, and discussing together and then and sarah one one question i just could just come in which i would like to talk to, which is uh, how do we talk about things as objectively as possible when it comes to sensitive topics like embryo research i i think perhaps the notion of talking objectively about things itself maybe is a bit of a, a mistake. I think sometimes saying, well, let's be rational, let's be objective, is perhaps used to minimise or to push aside people's uh, people's very real feelings and concerns about things. Um, as, as Anna has said, it's very hard to divorce the philosophical and the theoretical and the ethical from how things are in the real world. And so perhaps it's it's best not to pretend that we're going to be objective, but to objective position uh, in terms of embryo research. Perhaps we are parents of an IVF child who want to donate their embryos. Perhaps we have particular views about um, about the status of embryos. Um, perhaps we, um, you know, perhaps we have views about IVF and, and what it does. So rather than saying there's an objective viewpoint and everybody else is just being subjective, we should acknowledge that we all come from different perspectives on this. Yeah, I always have at the back of my mind in everything that I do that there's really no universal truth. Really, and you know, the triangle does have three sides, but apart from maths, you know, there's there's sort of subjectivity around absolutely everything, even the most objective looking research will have some bias in there. So I often just always remind myself, you know, this is this is perspective. Um, let's think about different truths from different perspectives. So what was, let's see what late 20th century psychological research did. Let's do the opposite of that. That's a can of worms. I just did, just reading a book on that the other day. Terrifying. Uh, even my last hero, David Rosenhan, who did the wonderful Sane in Insane Places. Turns out that was not as clear as we'd imagined. Um, where do you think uh, people should go along? I'll ask, ask both of you. This starting the Where where are the good starting points? If some someone says to you, "I want to understand more about this. I want to get not not just the science of it, but the implications of that." Where are the good places? The good sources for people. Well, actually, where I work at the Wellcome Genome Campus in Cambridge, we have a, a very yeah, rather excellent public engagement team, and they have a website called yourgenome.org. They receive five million new hits a year on it, and I think that just shows it's a testimony really to the quality of the information there. So if you want the technical science, it's there, but if you also want debate and discussion about the meaning of it, that's also there. So I'd say that was a good place to start. Sarah, are there any places? Um, yeah, I think the uh, public communication and the engagement work that's being done around a lot of the, the genomics work, so, um, you know, things like the uh, Genomics England initiative, uh, they'll have information that's there on their website, both for people who might be um, part of genomic research, but also for people who want to know what's it about, um, what, what's, it going to, what's it going to involve, what's going to be the outcome of this. Uh, so those sorts of organisations will usually have very good information out there. And you mentioned Gattaca, uh, and I want to. So, do you have? I'm going to ask both: is uh, a favourite film, TV show, or book where you think, well, that would never happen? But what an interesting idea in terms of <laughs> genetics. I love Jurassic Park. I really do. And there's so there's so much ethics in it. And there's there's also quite a lot of father daughter relationship weirdness themes in there as well but gosh there's so much ethics in it and i just i just love that 
and yes. that one's going to keep on running. I think they're, they're filming a new one now with Jeff Goldblum as well. So um, I will say, actually, Gattaca, even though it's more than 20 years old, is still one of my favourites. And the reason I think it's good is that although it, it so it does seem far fetched and dystopian, but it manages to present the issues in a very nuanced way. So we were talking earlier about the possibility of pop culture to help publics explore these issues. And I want to say there's a kind of pop culture or there's a kind of fiction or media that sort of does the opposite where it's an, it over sensationalizes things i'm thinking of film there's that very old film the island where everyone is cloned for their organs um and actually the best the, the best science fiction the best speculative fiction is not the one that tries to portray things in terms of black and white but the ones that make you ask well what if what if this and what would society be like and, you know, there are aspects of the society, even in Gattaca, uh, the main theme is around genetic determinism and the dystopia that that would create. Um, but you can imagine a world where instead of being classified and stratified and pushed into boxes based on your genes, you were given opportunities, you were given social support, you were given the health care um, that you knew in advance you would need. So we can think of different ways in which actually that information could be used in ways that would benefit society. And what I like about that is that it opens up the what ifs. What if the world could be a better place? I still best feel the best, best movie, sadly for the time being, is Mike Judge's Idiocracy, uh, where tragically I think he predicted it would be about 2050 or a little bit later, but I think it might have been 2016 where that one really kicked in. Um, thank you both very much. We should tell everyone that uh, under this as well there will be links to uh, the work of, uh, of Anna and Sarah and interviews that they've done and things like that as well if you want to find out more about what what they do as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for for watching or listening. And as we said, there one in two weeks time uh we're going to be with uh Ethan at Lysat. if you'd like to ask her uh any questions whatsoever on 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 her work uh i highly recommend again she's someone if you go onto youtube there's loads of fantastic talks that she did uh at the electric picnic uh kind of music stroke also science and ideas festival as well uh, there's lots of stuff there and also obviously uh the christmas lectures that she did with alice roberts so thank you very much thank you very much to uh everyone who uh supports this uh thank you very much to our producer uh Trent Burton, as I mentioned, we'll be doing our 24 hour science show uh, starting at midday on the 12th of December. Go and find out which astronauts, singers, comedians, and uh, theoretical physicists we've got doing that. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Bye bye. <laughs>